It's my great pleasure to present Henrique Augusto Souza, our uh, master student. He will talk about uh, the Muscle groups. So go ahead. Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Professor Sheila, for the opportunity to talk here about the research of my master's dissertation under the advice of Professor Zapata. And I want to talk to everyone about Diumskin groups. So some properties of subgroups of Diumskin groups that I've been studying on recent research articles and one particular result that I would like to present. So, okay. What my talk is going to be about. I'm going to talk about Diumskin groups and later on the talk, I will give a precise definition. But before we start, I would like to give a general notion to everyone that you may think as Diumskin groups as the pro P analogs of surface groups. So they are the dimension two equivalent of what you expect a surface group would be in the pro P world. And they include pro P completions of surface groups among the ranks. So it is nobody's at a loss to think of Diumskin groups as pro P surface groups. That's a very important class of examples of Diumskin groups. And I would like to start giving a general notion on the types of questions I studied for Diumskin groups and a bit on the historical developments of those questions, and then to focus on the specific results I would like to present. So the questions are all about generation of subgroups of Diumskin groups. So throughout this talk, my groups will, G, when I write G, is always a pro P group. This talk is solely concerned with pro P groups. And I'm going to use this notation, D of G for the minimal number of topological generators. So D of G is the minimal size of a generating set for a dense subgroup of G. So what type of questions was I interested in? Well, and when you take two closed and finitely generated subgroups of a pro P group G, you may ask a few things about them. Now, one first natural question is whether they satisfy Halson's property. So is their intersection finitely generated or not? Uh, it is known that some classes of groups satisfy this, some classes don't. So it is a natural question to ask. The second question was whether or not they satisfy the Hannah Neumann inequality. So the inequality that I am showing here is the classical inequality and it was trained later on in further papers, where it was originally presented as this question. So does their intersection is finitely generated and the rank of the intersection satisfies this bound? And the third question is whether uh, the subgroup is inert on the whole group. So when you intersect it with a finitely generated subgroup, is the rank of the intersection less than the group? So this is the concept of inertia that was present on the book of 96 by Dix Ventura. And that was one of the questions I was interested in for subgroups of Diumskin groups. And related to those questions, I was also interested on how those finitely generated subgroups sit inside the group. In, in what manner? Well, on virtual structures and most specifically retractions. So what is a retraction of a pro P group? Well, you consider a pro P group G and a closed subgroup of G called H and a continuous homomorphism of G onto H. This homomorphism is a retraction if when you restrict it to H, it is the identity. So it fixes everybody on every element of H. So uh, if, if there exists a retraction of G onto H, I will say that H is a retract of G. Um, there's some equivalent characterizations for retractions. So you have a retraction if and only if your group decomposes as a semi-direct product between G and the kernel. Uh, let me see if I can just turn on this pointer here. Well, oh, okay. Um, if and only if you have this. So this is one characterization of retractions. Another characterization, oh, another example of retractions is that a group retracts onto all its free factors. So by the universal property of a free factor, you can extend maps and you just take to be the identity on this free factor and the trivial map on all others and you will have a retraction there. So thinking about this property of retraction, uh, I was also interested in the questions of, you take a close and finitely generated subgroup of a pro P group G. When does this group satisfy local retractions? So 
the local retraction is asks, asks for an open subgroup U of G such that U retracts to H. And thinking about these examples uh, of free factors as retracts, we can also ask whether they have local free factors. So does the group G have an open subgroup U such as that H is a free factor of U? Again, there are some subgroups that satisfy this property. Um, some groups that don't, you may think of free groups, surface groups, um, surface groups as an example that satisfies local retractions, but not local free factors. So these are natural questions to ask. And I was interested in what has been done for them among the Umshkin groups. So how these questions have been studied throughout the years? Well, let me give a brief summary of the developments in, on these questions. First, for abstract groups, on 49, uh, Marshall Hall proved that free groups, abstract free groups, satisfy the local free factors property. So uh, groups with the, with the local free factors property are also known as Hall groups or Marshall Hall groups. On 54, Halson proved that free groups have the finitely generated intersection property. So the intersection of finitely generated subgroups is again finitely generated. And this property is also became known as Halson's property. On 57, Hannah Neumann proved the following inequality for finitely generated subgroups of free groups here, all in the, everything on the abstract case. And she conjectured that you can remove the two, the factor two here on the inequality. So the, the, the full inequality became known as the Hannah Neumann conjecture for free groups. And later on 78, Scott proved that surface groups satisfy local, satisfies local retractions. And on 96, Dixon Ventura proved the inertia of fixed point subgroups for some homomorphisms or endom injective endomorphisms of finitely generated free groups. So it was the first, they introduced the notion of inertia on that book and it was the first class of subgroups to be studied. Then on 2011, there came the independent solutions by Friedman and Mineyev of the Hannah Neumann inequality for free groups. And on this year, Antolin and Heikin prove for surface groups, the full Hannah Neumann inequality, uh, a strained version of it actually, the inertia for all retracts and also a property called L2 Hall property, which I'm also going to define properly a bit more further on the talk. So this was what was known for abstract groups and for pro-P groups, what was, what was done? Well, on 82, Lubotsky proved that finitely generated free pro P groups satisfies the Halson's property and the local free factors property. So local free factors is actually um, stronger than finite generated intersection property by Kurosh theorem. So I think, I think from one you can get the other, but you have independent proofs of the two facts there. And Hibbs proved on 91 that local free factors properties preserved under free pro P products. So if you take the free pro P product of Marshall Hall pro P groups, they are still Marshall Hall. And then on 2017, it was a very good year. So Schusterman and Zaleski proved that non-solvable Dumchkin group satisfies the Halson's, the Halson property and also the local retractions property. And they also gave a criterion, a classification for which pro P groups satisfies the local free factor property in terms of a decomposition uh, in elementary Marshall Hall groups. And on the same year, uh, Heikin proved the Hannah Neumann inequality for free pro-P groups. And on 2019, Heikin and Schusterman extended the result of the Hannah Neumann inequality for free pro-P groups to non-solvable Dimshkin groups. So we, we, there was this further development there. And this last topic, the Hannah Neumann inequality for non-solvable Dimshkin groups is actually one of the main theorems I would like to present on this talk. So what are the main results of this talk? Well, they talk about Dimshkin groups and I want to give an idea of the proof that most Dimshkin groups satisfies the Hannah Neumann inequality. Here, most means non-solvable or trivially finite. Uh, in the case, finite, finite Dimshkin groups and non-solvable Dimshkin groups. Those are the ones that satisfy the Hannah Neumann inequality. And using the techniques for the, from that proof, I will also like to present how you can prove that all Dumchkin groups satisfies inertia for retracts. So every retract of a Dumchkin group is also inert on the group. So 
With this in mind, uh, I'll need to give two definitions so I can properly state the theorems. I can state them formally. Uh, so uh, first I'm going to define Gimschkin groups and then the main object of the technique, which is L2 Betty numbers. So let's start with the definitions. I would like to give the precise definition of a Gimschkin group, a few examples and some of their properties. So if, if, I'm, if I'm going too fast or if there's any question, anyone please feel free to interrupt me anytime you want, anytime you like. Okay, so let's go for the first definition. What is a Dumschkin group? A uh, Dumschkin group is a pro P group that satisfies three conditions, three cohomological conditions, which are, what are, what are they? The first cohomological condition is the first cohomology group. Here is the continuous cohomology uh, or Galois cohomology of G with FP coefficients and trivial action. This cohomology needs to have finite dimension over FP. So it is an FP vector space. The second condition is that the second cohomology group must have dimension precisely one. And the third definition is that the cut product between the first two cohomology groups must be a non-degenerate bilinear form. So this has a combinatorial interpretation because those groups codify the presentation of the group. So the first cohomology group having finite dimension means that the group is finitely generated. So all Dushkin groups are finitely generated pro P groups. And the, num the minimal number of generators is precisely this dimension of the first cohomology. The second cohomology group uh, measures how many relations you must have among a minimal generating set. And the minimal number of relations is one. So these groups are one related. And the cup product being non-degenerate means that in some sense, this relation is being controlled by the, by the cup product. So if you understand how the cup product of two elements on the first cohomology group work, then you can deduce roughly how, how the presentation for this group would be. And there was a work by, that started with Yumshkin on the 50s, and then it was finished by Seh and Labut on the 60s for the classification of all Yumshkin groups. So using this, understanding this cup product was the key to classify their presentation. And there is a list of isomorphism classes of Dumchkin groups that are completely classified by their presentations. But uh, I will not need this classification here. So I will not, I don't want to get, uh, go into too much detail about it. But anyone with a keen topological eye will see that this definition looks roughly with Poincaré duality. And it is precisely Poincaré duality. So, the archetype for a Dumchkin group is the pro-P completion of an aspherical surface group. Uh, one needs to take some care when completing uh, non-orientable surfaces. You need to complete with respect to the prime two, or otherwise you will not get a Dumchkin group. But in general, for orientable surface groups, this forms the archetype for a Dumchkin group. But those are not all the Dumchkin groups. So Dumchkin also proved that if you take the maximal pro P quotients of Gala groups of local fields that contain a P root of unity, a primitive P root of unity, then this group will also be a Dumchkin group. So that's another important class of examples of Dumchkin groups. So what, what, what can we associate to them? How can we think about those Dumchkin groups? Because this definition is rather abstract, shall I say. Well, let's look first about the presentation because that's the first information that the definition is giving us. And Dimskin groups are always finitely generated, subject to a single relation. That's what the first two conditions of the definition gives us. And we can already define some numerical invariants associated to them. So the first numerical invariant, I'm going to call it D, it is the minimal number of generators, of topological generators. And as I said before, this number is precisely the dimension of the first cohomology group. And a second invariant is if you look at the abelianization, so Dumchkin groups are one relator groups, which means that their abelianization, if, if it has any torsion, then it has cyclic torsion. And the order of this cyclic torsion here is going to be our Q invariant. And this is, this is almost sufficient to classify all Dumchkin groups. Uh, if Q is not two, then Dumchkin prove that there is a single relation that classifies all those Dumchkin groups in terms of D and Q. So, those are very important invariants. And I'm not going to talk much about the Q invariant today, but 
it is a very important tool to understand and to work with those groups. So let me give a few examples of small Dimshkin groups. So by small, I mean with few number of generators. Uh, if we take cyclic Dimshkin groups or pro-cyclic Dimshkin groups that are one generated, well, there's only one such Dimshkin group, which is the cyclic group of all the two. And all of those characterizations are equivalent. So the only cyclic Dimshkin group is the is the group of the cyclic group of order two, the finite cyclic group of order two. And a Dimshkin group is cyclic if and only if it is finite, if and only if it has torsion. So though this is the smallest Dimshkin group and it's the only finite Dimshkin group. And this also gives us important information that all infinite Dimshkin groups are torsion free. And if we look with, of, to Dimshkin groups with at most two generators, those are precisely the solvable Dimshkin groups. And I haven't included here, but those are also precisely the, the Dimshkin groups that are piadic analytic. And therefore, the only Dimshkin groups of finite rank. So we all have, we have this characterization. And well, if you want to study subgroups of Dimshkin groups, then you need some tool to control them. And for free groups, which I like to call their, their cousins, you have Schreier formulas, and this controls how the open subgroups of G uh, work and how, how many generators they can have. And for Dimshkin groups, you have a similar characterization. So if you look for Dimshkin groups and you take open subgroups, every open subgroup of a Dimshkin group is again a Dimshkin group. And they satisfy a formula very similar to the Schreier formula for free groups. So the minimal number of generators of u minus two is proportional, index proportional to the minimal number of generators of g minus two. And this gives us a lot of information. So making, making a comparison with surface groups, every finite index subgroup of a surface group is again a surface group. And the number of generators is controlled by the genus. There are formula, a formula for the genus. And this is giving us the same this is the, the this Schreier formula plays the same role for Dumchkin groups. So every subgroup of a Dumchkin group is also going to be Dumchkin, and you can control their number of generators. So this also gives us the information that if D of G is not two, is bigger than two. So if it is not a solvable Dumchkin group, then the rank of its open subgroups grows linearly with the index. So in this sense, they look a lot like free groups. So their open subgroups keeps getting larger and larger and larger uh, as you go down their chain. Okay, so we have a definition of Dumchkin group and some examples. So with this, I can already state the strain and Hanna Neumann inequality that was proven by Schustemann and Heiken on 2019. So what is the statement of the strain and Hanna Neumann inequality for Dumchkin groups? So you take G, a non-solvable Dumchkin group. So it is at least three generated and you take H and K, two closed, sub, two closed and finitely generated subgroups of G. Then you consider the set S. This set S uh, is precisely representants of the, the intersection of H and K up to conjugation. So this set uh, of intersections that is not, the set of intersections that are not trivial uh, is finite up to conjugation. And if we take this sum, of the ranks of this intersection, the reduced ranks of this intersection, it is still less than the product of the reduced ranks of each subgroup. And well, this implies the classical inequality because certainly, well, if the intersection is non-trivial, then we have the rank, the reduced rank of the intersection there with the trivial representant x equals to one. And the reason we ask for the Dumchkin group on the statement to be non-solvable is that for infinite solvable Dumchkin groups, this inequality never holds. So if the Dumchkin group is finite, then you only have two subgroups. So you can check that this inequality always holds. But if it is a solvable subgroup, then you can always find two closed subgroups such that the set is infinite, the set S. And you can find two open sub subgroups such that the set S is finite but the inequality does not hold. So the left-hand side is strictly bigger than the right-hand side. You can always do that for infinite solvable Dumchkin groups. 
So we asked them for non-solvable Dimitri groups, what can be done? And the main ingredient to prove this inequality comes through L2 Betty numbers, which is the second definition of this talk. So what are L2 Betty numbers? So the definition here is a bit contrived, so bear with me for a while. We take M to be an FPG module. So I should give write a bit about this. So FPG means the completed group algebra. My pen is failing me. So completed group algebra. And an FPG module is, well, don't fail me now. Oh, this must be the ugliest. Okay. G is a completed group algebra. FPG is the completed group algebra. And M is a module over it. So it is a topological vector space over FP. And with this topology, it is a profinite group. It is actually a pro P group. So you may think of this as it satisfies the usual properties of group algebras and M satisfies the usual properties of modules. So it is the thing that makes profinite homology work. So examples of this, um, you may think FP with trivial coefficients and uh, free FPG modules over a space onto which G acts. So, or free FP modules over this space. So you're not allowed to think that this thing here is simply the module that makes everything work on the profinite pro P setting. So whenever you have these homology groups finite, you can define these numbers as this infimum. And this infimum here is that we're taking the FP dimensions of the homology groups normalized by the index. And we take the infimum over all open subgroups. And this is well defined because this chain is actually decreasing with respect to inclusion. So this L2 Betty number here, I'm going to call it the ETH L2 Betty number of M with respect to G is a well-defined non-negative real number. And these Betty numbers are going to codify all the information we need for the Hannah Neumann inequality. And what properties does it have? What do we need to know about them? Well, the first thing we need to know about them is that they are index proportional. So if we know the Betty number, the ETH Betty number of M with respect to G, then we can also induce the Betty number to any open subgroup just by multiplying by the index. So this is straight from the, from the definitions you can verify this property. So it suffices to know the Betty number for some open subgroup and then you know for all open subgroups by this proportionality. Um, it also behaves well under induced modules. So here induced module is the usual construction from commutative algebra, except on the, com on the completed setting. So you take tensor product with the group algebra. So if you take the Betty number of an induced module, uh, the induced module from age to G of M, this is precisely the if Betty number of M with respect to age for every closed subgroup, this always works. And this is a consequence of the Shapiro isomorphism for homology. And the last property we need is that this Betty number is subadditive with respect to short exact sequences of modules. And this comes from the long exact sequence induced on homology. So with these three properties, we're going to encapsulate how, how the Hannah Neumann inequality can be formulated homologically. And with this definition of L2 Betty numbers, I can formulate the other theorem I want to talk about, which is the independence of intersections. So what I'm, what I'm, going to, what I'm talking about independence we're going to say that a finitely generated subgroup of a group G is L2 independent if its first Betty number vanishes for this module here. So this FP G modulo H is simply the FP vector space given by inverse limit of this profinite space here, G modulo H, and it has an augmentation map to FP that ignores all coefficients and sums up all coefficients. So this, 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 the kernel of this map is an G module and we consider its first Betty number. If the first Betty number of this kernel vanishes, we're going to say that the subgroup H is L2 independent. And the result that uh, I managed to obtain was this. So 
you start with a non-solvable Dirichlet group G and H and L2 independent of G. L2 in the uh, H is an L2 independent subgroup of G. So for any K, a closed finitely generated subgroup of G, the intersection H cap K is L2 independent in K. And I'm going to show that this actually implies that every retract is inert in G. So it is a corollary of this property. So this is this was obtained for surface groups the, uh, this year by Antolin and Heikin. And now we have an analog for Dimskin groups as well. So first, I need to talk about the proof of the Hanna Neumann inequality, because the techniques that apply to one theorem are very similar to the techniques that apply to the other. So what role do L2 Betty numbers have to do with the Hanna Neumann inequality? We need to relate the quantities on the inequality, the reduced ranks, with Betty numbers. And well, this is done by two lemmas that I'm going to state now. So the first lemma that was on the 2019 article is that if you calculate the L2, the first L2 Betty number of this module with respect to G, so this module here is the, again, the FP vector space over this profinite space given by a limit, the inverse limit of G module age as finite spaces. And this is a G module. We can calculate its Betty number. And this Betty number controls the reduced rank of H. So this looks very much like the right-hand side of the Hannah Neumann inequality. And how, how can we see this? Well, this module is actually the induced module from H to G of the trivial module FP with trivial coefficients. So again, we have a Shapiro isomorphism for Betty numbers. So we are reduced to calculate the Betty number of FP with, um, with respect to the group H. But this is the rank gradient because the first homology group, the dimension of the first homology group uh, controls the minimal number of generators. And the rank gradient is given by the Schreier formulas. So if H is open, then we have a Schreier formula for Dirichlet groups. And it gives us the first case here, D of, G, D of H minus two. And if G is closed, then G is a free propy group and we have a Schreier formula like the usual Schreier formula and we get precisely D of H minus one. So the right-hand side of the Hannah Neumann inequality can be stated in terms of L2 Betty numbers of certain G modules. Okay, but what about the left-hand side? Well, this, is all, this also can be done. So again, we take a, a non-solvable Dirichlet group G and you take two non-closed, two closed, non-trivial, finitely generated, infinite index subgroups, H and K. And you consider this G module here. So here I'm, I'm taking the, the, free, the free module over this, oh, this is not a, the free module, but free FP over these two, these two spaces. And I'm taking the tensor product with FP. And this is the tensor product on the category of profile module. So this is a completed tensor product, also given by a inverse limit. And if I consider the Betty number of this G module here, G can act here um, both on, G acts on the left here on both modules. So it is a G module and you get the, this first Betty number and it is precisely the sum of the left-hand side of the Hannah Neumann inequality. Um, and then again, how can we see this? Well, this tensor product is the induced module. We can think of it as the induced module from H to G of the second factor. So again, we are reduced to calculating the Betty number of this FP G module K with respect to age. But as an age, mod as an age module, we have the double class formula. So give, by studying the action of age on this quotient, we can actually decompose this module as this direct sum where X runs through all the representants for these double cosets. And each one of those is again an induced module. So when we take this homology, we are reducing to the homology of this intersection, age intersection, the conjugate of K to X. And when X runs through all the representants of the double cosets. And a property that we can apply is that the Betty number is actually additive with respect to profinite direct sums. So this direct sum is the direct sum over a profinite set as defined by Melnikov. And the homology commutes with this direct sum. So the dimension commutes and the Betty number will also commute with this direct sum. So we can actually write the Betty number as the sum of the individual Betty numbers of all of those ones. 
And like, we have already calculated the Betty number for FP coefficients. It is the rank gradient. And since H and K both have infinite index, then they are free pro P. And this is going to give us precisely the reduced rank here on the right hand side. So we, we managed to show that both sides of the Hanna Neumann inequality can be stated in terms of L2 Betty numbers. Uh, and the, the factors that appear on the right hand side are precisely the multiplication of the Betty numbers here on this tensor product. So if we show that the Betty number is submultiplicative with respect to this property, then we get the Hanna Neumann inequality. And that's the strategy, actually. So before we move to show this submultiplicativity of the Betty number, um, Heikin and Schustelman proved some conjectures for Dirichlet groups that are of their own interest, and they're also important on the proof. So the first conjecture uh, I'd like to point out is the Atia conjecture for Dirichlet groups. So the Atia conjecture, one of its many forms uh, for abstract groups and also for pro P groups asks if the Betty numbers are integers for torsion free groups. And for infinite Dumchkin groups, they're always torsion free. So if we take a finite generated module, is the zero of Betty number an integer? And for a finitely presented module, here presented only means that it is the quotient of a finitely generated free module by another finitely generated submodule. So for a finitely presented, is the first Betty number also an integer? And this is actually proven for Dumchkin groups. And how, how, how do we proceed to prove this? Well, Harris proved in 79 that torsion-free, finitely generated periodic analytic groups satisfies the ATR conjecture. And his proof is very technical. I do not want to talk about those details, but he holds for this class, of, this class T of groups. And any infinite Dumchkin group is residually T. So we can find a residual chain of normal subgroups uh, on, on any infinite Dumchkin group such that the quotient is torsion-free, finitely generated, periodic analytic. And when we consider the Betty numbers along this chain, we can show that the zeroth Betty number of any module, any finitely generated module, is going to be arbitrarily close to the integers. But if it is a real number that is arbitrarily close to the integers, it must be an integer itself. And this shows that the zero of Betty number is always an integer. And for the first Betty number, if it is finitely presented, then the first Betty number is a combination, an affine combination of the zero of Betty numbers arising from the presentation. So integrality of the zero of Betty number also implies integrality of the first Betty number. So this settles the Tia conjecture for Dumchkin groups. And I believe these are all groups for which we know, pro P groups for which we know the Tia conjecture are derived from this from this result of Harris. So free pro P groups, uh, Dimshkin groups, and finite generated theoretical analytic groups. So that is, that's how it's done. And as a consequence for, of the Atia conjecture is the Kaplansky zero divisor conjecture for the completed group algebra. So FPG is a completed group algebra. And if G has torsion, then this thing will obviously have uh, zero divisors, non-trivial zero divisors. But if the group is torsion-free, then one may ask, well, does this group ring, does this group algebra have any zero divisors? And the consequence of the Atia conjecture is that the completed group algebra does not have any zero divisors. So this is an integral domain for any group, pro P group that satisfies the Atia conjecture. And this is because we have a characterization of free FPG modules, if and only if this equality holds for the zero of Betty number. So the zero of Betty number is actually just given by the first, um, the first homology group. And we apply that to the principal ideals. So we can show that the principal ideals will be free, so their annihilator is trivial. And this shows that the group algebra is an integral domain. So these are some conjectures. The, the Atia conjecture is really important in the proof of the Hanna Neumann inequality, and the Kaplansky con conjecture comes as a corollary of that. So now you're ready to prove the Hanna Neumann inequality. We just need a final lemma to, to see how we're going to use the properties of the L2 Betty numbers to derive some multiplicativity. So we do not have, we do not know how it behaves under tensor products, but we know how it behaves under short exact sequences. It is subadditive. So if we can find vanishing results for certain submodules, we can exploit that to show some multiplicativity. 
So the final lemma that was proven also on the paper of 2019 is that take G an infinite Dirichlet group and age a closed finitely generated subgroup of G. So there was a typo here, I'm sorry. Any FPG module that is finitely related over age has an open FPG module with this vanishing Betty number here for age. So the Betty number may not vanish for age, but an op it vanishes at an open submodule. So this is the first vanishing result we need. And the second vanishing result is that, well, for any, for any closed finitely generated subgroup age, we consider again this G module, and it has an open submodule uh, over an open subgroup U, such as that its co-dimension is controlled by the Betty number of the whole of the whole module, and its Betty number for U vanishes. So this is the second vanishing result we need. So it's a, a refinement of the first result on the specific case where the module is this FP module over the G modulo age space. So, okay, we have the lemma and now we can give an idea of the proof. How is it done? So the hard part of the Hohner Neumann inequality is when both age and K have infinite index. So for finite index, we just use the Schreier formulas and this gives us the inequality straight away. So for infinite index, both of age, both age and k are free property groups. How do we proceed? Well, the second part of the lemma gives us an open subgroup U and a submodule A of this first factor, such that we can get this inequality by subadditivity for the Betty number with respect to U. Uh, again, we're just using the exact sequence. A is a submodule of, of FPG modulo H and it quotients out to this factor here. And if you look at the last term, this is bounded by this product of Betty numbers. Why? Because this, this if you consider this product here, uh, FPG modulo age, quotient out by A and it tensor product with FPG modulo K, this has a, fi a filtration, a finite filtration for finitely many steps uh, with the quotients given by the last factor, FPG modulo age, and the number of steps is at most this first Betty number, B1 of G, B1 of FP, G module age with respect to G. This was on the lemma how we controlled the dimension, the co-dimension of the module A. So we just apply subadditivity a finite number of times and we get this bound for the last term. And we wanted to show some multiplicativity. And here we have Betty numbers with respect to U. So if you multiply both sides of the inequality by the index, you get the original uh, so multiplicativity result and you get the original Hanna Neumann inequality. We just need to show that the first term vanishes. But then we apply the first part of the lemma to this first, to this first term. So we apply this first part of the lemma to get B, an open subgroup, such, as that, such that we can limit this Betty number by this other sum. And both of these terms will vanish. Why? The first term vanishes because we can bound it above by the Betty number of B with respect to H, and this is zero by the hypothesis of the lemma. And the second one vanishes because we can use the same filtration argument. So we, we are tensoring A with a finite module. So it has a series of, series of submodules with successive quotients given by A, and we apply subadditivity a finite number of times and we can bound the last term by above, uh, above by the L2 Betty number of A with respect to U, which is also zero by the lemma. So those both terms vanish and we get some multiplicativity. And this implies the Hanna Neumann inequality for the Unschkin groups. So how, how can this proof can be used to give, the, to give us inertia? Well, first we need to talk a bit about uh, the independence of intersections, because that is exactly what we want to prove. So we, now we are considering just like the, 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 the last theorem. So G is a non-solvable Dimension group and H is a finitely generated, but now L2 independent subgroup of G. And we want to prove that the intersection is L2 independent for all finitely generated subgroups. So if we recall the definition of L2 independent, it means that this kernel here, which I call N, the first L2 Betty number of N with respect to G is zero. And we want to prove that 
the first L2 Betty number of M with respect to K is zero to obtain this independence of intersection. And M is a submodule of M by the usual inclusion, the inclusion of K module the intersection inside G module age. And we can identify this as a submodule. So we know that the Betty number of N with respect to G vanishes and we want to obtain the vanishing of the Betty number of K with respect to N. And then we're going to induce from the, Betty, from the vanishing of the Betty number for N, the vanishing of the Betty number for M. And this will give us the independence results. But the Betty number for N, we can actually write it as a Betty number of this tensor product, G modulo K tensored with N with respect to G, just by taking induced modules. So if again, we prove submultiplicativity, we can show that this number vanishes. And since K is a free pro P group, because we're only considering the infinite index, the finite index is rather trivial to show with index proportionality. Since K is free, uh, its first homology group is left exact. So it preserves injections, which means that the first bet number is monotonic. So we, since M is a submodule of N, if it vanishes for N, it vanishes for M. So that's all we need to prove. And we proceed just like the Hannah Neumann inequality. So we're going to establish some multiplicativity again. So we take U and open subgroup as in the second part to obtain a bound on the first term of the product. So we are bounding this tensor as these two factors. Now, the, the last term is bounded by the product, by the same filtration, filtration argument. So this gives us zero because the U Betty number of N is proportional to the G Betty number of N and this one is zero by hypothesis. So we only need to control the first term, just like in the theorem for Hahn Neumann. And now we apply the first part of the lemma to N to obtain this second bound here with B and N modulo B. And now N modulo B is finite because we took, we took an open submodule of N and we can apply the filtration argument to show that the second term will vanish. And the vanishing of the first term, we also can use monotonicity in this case. So A will be a submodule of G modulo H. And then the Betty number of A with respect to G modulo H of, of the tensor product A tensor B uh, is going to be less than or equal to the Betty number of FB G modulo H tensor B and this is the induced module and it's going to be the Betty number of B with respect to H and everything vanishes. So both terms vanish and we get the vanishing of the original Betty number. And if it vanishes for U, it vanishes for G. So it's going to vanish for K. So this proves that every intersection of an L2 independent subgroup with a finitely generated subgroup is going to still be L2 independent. And how does this relate to inertia? Well. Every, every L2 independent subgroup is actually bounded. And this follows quite straight from the definition because H is L2 independent if this Betty number vanishes, where M fits into this short exact sequence. And we apply subadditivity to get the following chain of inequalities. So here on the middle, we have the first Betty number of FB uh, G modulo H with respect to G. On one hand, we can use the Shapiro isomorphism to get the first L2 Betty number, the first L2 Betty number of FB with respect to H. And we have already calculated that this is D of H minus two. Uh, I, I like to point out that every L2 independent subgroup of a Dumchkin group, if the Dumchkin group is non-solvable, this is going to be free pro P. So it's going to be precisely D of H minus one, but it's bounded below by D of H minus two. So this inequality holds in general. And on the other hand side, by the subadditivity, we get that this Betty number is less than or equal to the Betty number of G with respect to F, of FP with respect to G. And this is the rank gradient of G, which we know to be D of G minus two. So this gives us the bound on the ranks. And now we only need to show that retracts are L2 independent, but this was proven on, this, on the paper of this year by Antolin and Hiking, that if you take an infinite Dumchkin group and age a closed subgroup such that the induced map on the Fratinis is injective, then age is L2 independent. And why is this so? Because again, we denote M by the kernel of this augmentation, and we want to prove that 
the first Betti number of m is zero, but injectivity on the Frutini is equivalent to surge activity of this map here on the long exact sequence, which shows that our module m is either a free module or is a one related FPG module. And by the Atiyah conjecture, the Betti number for one related FPG modules also vanish. So in both cases, we have the vanishing of the Betti number. So these groups are L2 independent. And in particular, every retract is L2 independent because every retract induces uh, splitting on the Fertini map. So we get L2 independence for retractions. And now we can finish the result. So what we get is a corollary. Every retract of a Dirichlet group is inert on G. This follows from the Schreier formula for if G is solvable because those are going to be they are going to be a finite rank, so it is either pro-cyclic or uh, a Dumchkin group, a two-generated Dumchkin group, so this is trivial for solvable. And for non-solvable groups, we apply the last theorem. So retracts are L2 independent, and L2 independent uh, is preserved by intersections with finitely generated subgroups, and every L2 independent is bounded. So this gives us inertia. So we just apply the last theorem for non-solvable Dumchkin groups. But actually, can, we can say more. Uh, we have the L2 Hall property for Dimshkin groups. So every closed, finitely generated subgroup H of a Dimshkin group G is virtually L2 independent. And this simply follows from the theorem by Schusterman and Zaleski of 2017 that every, uh, every finitely generated non solvable Dimshkin group satisfies local retractions for finitely generated subgroups. And when you look for the solvable case, then every group is going to be L2 independent. This is just a direct calculation that all, all those Betty numbers are going to vanish. And this finishes what I would like to thank to all, or I'd like to talk today. Um, just a remark is that no infinite Dumushkin group satisfies the Marshall Hall property. This was also on the paper by Schusterman and Zaleski. So there's also another elementary proof of this fact, but they have classified all pro P finitely generated groups that satisfies the local free factors property. And th those do not include infinite Dirichlet groups. But with the both corollary, you can recover the L2 version of this property. So L2 Hall and Marshall Hall are not directly related, but they share some properties. So there is something to, to cling on to. And that finishes what I would like to, to talk. Thank you very much. And please, if there is any questions, feel free to. Thanks. Thanks for, let's thank to Henrique Souza, please. Sweet the microphone, please. Now, uh, if you have some questions, please. Well, I Somebody have a have question. Some questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yes, what yeah. about uh, Bergman for Dermushkin groups? Uh, can you please give me the statement of Bergman? Uh, suppose uh, so suppose you have retract of the Omushkin yes. group, all right, and you have a subgroup H. Is H intersection uh, R a retract of H? Oh, I I do not know it straight away. I have not thought because, about it. Because if it is true, then uh, then this inertia follows trivially from this. Yes, yes, it's going to be a retract, and it follows trivially. Sure. Um, I don't know. I have, not, I have not thought about this, but it may be, it may hold. So it may be it may be possible to do this, but I do not know. In, in some sense, pro-p groups are better than abstract groups. And uh, counter example was uh, for free groups, right? Were constructed where uh, for the subgroup which is not closed in the pro-p topology. I see. So for closed subgroups, it may still hold. Well, of, and for open as well, but I mean, it's, yes. In in fact, that is in, it. It suffices to check it for open subgroups because they're going to write them as an intersection, right? Right. So yes. okay. Yes, I, I I do not know straight away, but uh, it might be possible. But we're going to look at the. Um, Oh, I do not know how is how how the proof for the abstract case works if it can be directly translated for for the for the Dimshkin world. No, for abstract group it doesn't. But uh, you see, for free property groups, right? Retracts ah. are free factors, and therefore this is trivial. 
Yes. I mean, you just apply Kurush. But for Jomushkin group, uh, it might hold because pro P groups just better. Yes. I, I do not know straight away, but I'll, I'll think about it. And... OK. No, no, and I, I also have a remark. Uh, I don't think that for surface groups and Jomushkin groups, you should uh, you should use Shraya formula for the for the rank formulas. I think oh, for right. surface groups, it is it is Hurwitz formula, formula, right? And maybe it is even better to use Hurwitz than Shraya formula. But so certainly, when you say Shraya formula, it is just only for free groups, so free profinite groups, or for free pro p groups, but not for uh, groups with some relators. Okay, see, understand. Thank you. Some other questions, please. I I have a, a question, but is it's uh, do you prove it uh, before or after the presentation of Free and Ray? Uh, it was actually on the day of the presentation. Uh, I don't know if everyone remembers, but I asked him this question if it holds for Dimitri yes, yes. and because of the I asked it. <laughs> yeah, so, so when he when he said, well, it probably holds, it should hold, then I sat down that night and tried to prove it. And ah, good, that was very really good. Quick. And and could you prove something for for three parts of a finite number of the, the Moscow groups in the same sense? So when we consider free products of the Umshin groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a number of, a finite number of these. Well, so this, the question will be if we have retracts of a finite number of 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 Dimshin group of free products of Dimshin group. Yes. Well, those retracts are going to be finitely generated, and for those for those subgroups, we do have a Kurush formula. So maybe by using the Kurush the Kurush decomposition for them, yes, it might yes. be possible. But I haven't tried it out, but it might it might be possible. Yes. We have to see how this exactly is the question. I mean, what statement for, for free product of the Amushkin groups we wanted to prove? So the free product of every retract of a free product of the Amushkin groups is inert. Oh. On the free product. It should be probably true with the same proof. Maybe, yes. Yes, is the question. Because there's also the, the, the theorem of Melnikov on the homology of free products. So Everything should be composed nicely. It should be possible. Okay. Uh, somebody have uh, some other question? If not, let's thank again, Henrique. Please sit the microphone.